All right, let's begin. Welcome to CS 2050. Uh, the topic of today is finite probability theory. We're just going to sort of do a basic introduction into what probability theory is. Probability theory is, uh, is, a, a, is a science about odds. Um, it was invented um, really by the needs of two people. Uh, chemists, first of all, needed probability theory. And second of all, gamblers. Oh, and astronomers, too. They needed certain odds about things. Um, uh, every every you know, mathematical theory is uh, dependent upon things that are invented in the real world, right? So, and humans in, in, in particularly have really bad uh, uh, intuition and understanding about the way odds and things work. You know, uh, if you have ever known anyone who's into gambling, I mean, you, you, they really have, you know, uh, something wrong with them. Um, uh, so when you develop a mathematical theory like this, it has a lot of like good explanatory power. Like it can help explain certain things to you, uh, and make uh, math things that are mathematically true uh, can go against your intuition. But because it's math, you can't really argue with it with it, and it can help evolve and change your own intuition. So throughout history, there's many almost perfect but technically wrong formulations of what probability theory should be. So we give a set of axioms for, for what we call probability theory. We have what's called an event space. An event space is a finite set of what are called events. And we use big omega containing little omegas. Omega 1, omega 2, to omega, let's say, capital N. Okay? And each of these is what's called an outcome. An outcome is a thing that occurs. Something happens. An outcome happens. Now, if it's a coin flip, then the out possible outcomes are you get a heads or you get a tails. So an action is, happens, and you have a set of possible outcomes, omega 1 through omega n. Um, each outcome is assigned a, a probability, p1 to the pn, uh, such that omega i occurs with probability uh, pi, right? Um, what should the sum of i equals 1 to capital N of pi be? This is not a question. I th we, we don't know enough yet for us to like say definitely what this should be. But if you had to fa fathom, what would you want the sum of the possibilities to be equal to? 1. You want, uh, if, you have a, if you place odds on something, you want the sum of all possible odds of all possible outcomes that occur to be one, total to 1. You know, if something is 40% odds of occurring, uh, then some, the action of that not occurring should be 60% and not something else, like 90% or something weird, right? So uh, the sum of the probability should sum to 1. An event uh, is a set of outcomes, formally some set of outcomes. Um, and we define that the probability of an event to be this little PR, and, and, I, and I use square brackets, but you may see circle brackets or whatever. The probability that an event occurs is going to be the sum of the probabilities of the outcomes in that event. We'll say uh, omega uh, in omega i in uh, a of pi. Right. You sum over the possible probabilities that each of the outcomes of the event occurs, and that's the probability of that event. Right. Um, we'll, of course, do some examples, but this is just so, sort of the formal definition. Right. Question so far? Maybe you've seen something like this somewhere, very basic stuff. We'll do some coin flipping examples and so on. Um, a probability distribution. We won't get too much into this part of probability theory, but probability distribution informally is a function p that maps i to the probability pi. So given event i, uh, the probability di distribution in some sense is the way the randomness is distributed. Which outcomes have which probability? Well, in, especially in this class, I mean, I think as a CS major, you have to take a stats class. Uh, so you'll do this very in depth. But you should just know that there's really 
like two or three important ones. The ones we'll deal with the most is what's called the uniform distribution. And the uniform distribution is that where P1 is equal to P2 is equal to da, 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 is equal to Pn, okay, for, the, for outcomes 1 through n. If, uh, the, if the uniform distribution is called, such, is called that simply because every outcome is equally likely in the uniform distribution. You have n possible outcomes. They all happen with equal chance. If you have a uniform distribution, what is the probability, what is Pi equal to then? If you have n possible chances, n possible outcomes, each happens equally likely, then the probability one of those outcomes has to occur has to be 1 over n. Why? Because you have n things, and they must sum to 1. So one, each one of them must be 1 over n, right? If you have, a, if you have a two outcomes, you have a coin, you, either, you have a half chance of getting heads and half chance of getting tails, right? Three outcomes, 1 over 3, and so on, right? Um, uh, if you have the uniform distribution, and, and if unstated in this class, we'll assume it's a uniform distribution. Uh, and you have some uh, outcome, uh, excuse me, some event A. What is the probability of outcome A? Excuse me, of event A. For any A, in fact. It's just the number of elements in A divided by N. It's uniform. Is that what you're going to say? OK. Um, so given a mathematical theory, you should do, so like uh, every mathematical theory does two things. One, explains all past previous evidence. Okay. You make some observations. You watch a coin flip a couple times, and you try to explain why that occurs. Two, given the mathematical theory, you should be able to use it to predict future events. You should be able to use it to make future predictions. You know, this is true in physics, chemistry, whatever. You take the mathematical theory, you extend it, you're like, okay, what if this happens? And then certain things happen, you know? Um, so for example, um, what is the probability of omega? Under any distribution, in fact. One. Yeah. Basically, what we're saying is the probability that something happens is 1, because the problem is formulated that an outcome occurs. Uh, or so, the sum of the outcomes, the, the event of omega is everything, right? So there is no, it's definitely not less than 1, the sum of an outcome, the, the, the probability of an event, because there is no chance that it doesn't occur, right? Um, what about um, the probability of that nothing occurs? These are simple examples, but I'm just showing you it lines up with our intuition about the way randomness should work. You know, uh, what about the probability? What about what? Did, what do we think the probability of a complement is? Where a complement again, this is the power of set theory. We can define probability theory on top of set theory. A is just a set. It's just a subset of omega, right? What should the probability of a complement be? Yes, but what is that? That is true. 1 minus the cardinality of A over N. Yes. Let's work this one out. What is the, what is the cardinality of A complement? Uh, the cardinality of omega minus uh, the cardinality of A. And what is the cardinality of omega? N. N. 
So the probability of A complement is just 1 minus the probability of A. This is showing the intermediary work, but you should jump to the end and say, yeah. This also is, extends our own intuition. Like, we are observing that this probability, the axioms of probability theory are good. You know? If something occurs with probability A, the probability that it doesn't occur is 1 minus that probability, right? If you have 20% odds of something occurring, then the chance that that thing doesn't occur is 80%. Everything in the world ever either is or isn't. So everything that the chance that something doesn't happen is going to be one minus the chance that it does. Right? This is a, a, a useful fact if you need this. Sometimes it's easier to compute things with the one minus, uh, easier to compute probability than computing the complement of some event. Right? Questions so far? All right, let's do some examples. Suppose you uh, roll a die. We could formalize this as our a set of possible outcomes are going to be omega 1 to omega 6. And um, there are six possible outcomes. We may say that the die is uniform in the sense that when you roll the die, each outcome is equally likely, right? So if you, what is the probability that you roll a 3? One sixth. Formally, you would consider, uh, I'm, I'm writing it this way. It's not like the worst sloppy notation. But a rolling a three is an, ev is an event. And the event is a set of outcomes. Here, uh, our event is this, the, is this one, right? So that has size one. And then using the probability formula, you do one over six, right? Uh, what is the probability uh, you roll a prime? Half. Why? Because it's 2, 3, and 5. Yeah. So here your, your set of possible outcomes are going to be uh, omega 2, omega 3, skip 4, skip 6, skip 1. So it's going to be omega 5, yeah. And that's going to be the size of A over... Uh, the size of a over over n, so it's going to be three over six, which is going to be one half. Right? Yes. Is uh, one not considered a prime? One is not prime, by definition. And uh, why is it the case? Well, if one was prime, you don't get. It's it's a convention mathematicians have chosen um, out of convenience because it looks cooler if it's not prime. Uh, recall we proved unique factorization. Okay, but one divides into every number infinitely many times. So then those are non-unique factorizations of every number. Write, write, uh, write 15 as 3 times 5 times 1 to the 100. Doesn't help. It's not a unique factorization. It's also equal then to 3 times 5 times 1 to the 1,000. Two different factorizations of 15 if 1 was prime. So we just so we can say that there's a unique factorization, conventionally we just say 1 is not prime. Um, yeah. Um, what is the probability you uh, roll a number uh, greater than or equal to 4? One third. Why? Uh, one half. Why? Because you can roll 4, 5, or 6. Yeah, 4, 5, or 6. So there's three outcomes out of 6, right? What is the probability you roll an even? Half the numbers between 1 and 6 are even. 2, 4, 6, right? Different, one thing we notice immediately is different events have the same probability. So if you want to, you know, you're doing a game or something, and it's like, well, the chance that you roll a prime number is equal to the chance that you roll an even number. Not too surprising there, but 6 is quite small. Now, if you were to do 1 through 1,000 or something, those numbers would be different, right? How many primes are there between 1 and 1,000? I guarantee you it's not 500. Right. So, um, what is the probability uh, you don't get a one? Five six. Yeah. Why? You have a one six chance to roll a one, and then one minus one six is five six. 
one minus the probability you roll a six. You mean you roll a one? You roll a one, yes. Sorry. So what is the probability you roll a one? It's uh, one six. So you take one minus one six. There's going to be it's five six, right? So oftentimes, applying this one minus formula is really useful. Like this is an example where it maybe doesn't help too much because you could easily just you could have mentally taken the complement and saying things that are not six must be two through five, and there's five of those things. Um, and that's uh, no one would fault you for that. But for some more complicated problems, doing the one minus thing is going to be more useful, right? Um, so what is the, let's do, let's do an interesting problem. Um, let's say you roll two die. Uh, what is the probability, prob probability they sum to seven? Let's, let's uh, do this. Does anyone else off the top of their head? I don't expect you to. OK, never mind then. Um, what, is our out, what is our set of possible outcomes? How many, before we list them all out, how many, how many elements are in the set of possible outcomes? 36 outcomes. By the way, in general, probability theory, even when the events sound like they are interchangeable, it is always a permutation and not a combination. 2, 5 is different than 5, 2, even though those sum to the same thing. That's just a general rule of thumb to do. So let's actually compute the, the I'll, I'll even say just this is 36, and it contains all possible pairs of numbers of uh, 1 and 6, right? Um, what is the smallest number you can have? 2. What is the largest number you can have? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do so. This is going to take me a minute. I'm going to compute all of the possible uh, ones. How many ways are there to sum to 2? There's one way, 1, 1, right? How many ways are there to sum to 12? It's 6, 6. How many ways are there to sum to 3? It's going to be... Uh, 1, 2, and 2, 1. How many ways are there sum to, f sum to 4? 3, 1, 1, 3, and 2, 2, right? How many ways are there to sum to 5? You have 4, 1, 1, 4, uh, 3, 2, 2, 3, okay? How many ways are there to sum to 6? We got 5, 1, 1, 5. I'm going to try and go a little fast. We got uh, 4, 2, uh, 2, 4. And then we got 3, uh, uh, 5, 4. We got 3, 3, right? Did I do that right? 5, 1, 1, 5, 2, 4, 4 2, 3, 3. That's, that's all the combinations of 6. Yeah. OK. All the numbers I know are 0, 1, and n. I'm going to mess up here. Yeah? You have to include 3, 3 twice, or 3 Ah, uh, yes. Because, no. No. Consider that they're ordered. So the first one is different than the second one. Right? But the first time you roll it, there's 3, 3 is, consider that there is no interchanging of die. Suppose we call it die 1 and die 2. So 3, 3 is die 1 is a 3 and die 2 is a 3. That's the same as die 2 is a 3 and die 1 is a 3. But don't get them mixed up. Now, here, you can get them mixed up, but don't. Think of this. The reason it's 36 elements is it's a Cartesian product of all possible ways you can roll die 1, which is 6, and all possible ways you can roll die 2. Uh, 7 is going to be 6, 1, uh, 1, 6, uh, 5, 2. Uh, 2 comma 5, uh, 4 comma 3, and uh, 3 comma 4. Okay. 8 is going to be, uh, what are the possible combinations of 8? Let's see if you guys can list some of these out for me. How many possible ways can you roll a die to sum to 8? 2 comma 6, 6 comma 2, 
Is that all of them? Yeah. Uh, what about 9? We got 6, 3, uh, 3, uh, 3, 6. What else? 4, 5, 5, 4. Right? Uh, what about 10? We got 5, 5. What else do we got? 6, 4, and 4, 6, right? Anything else for 10? Nope. What about 11? We got 6, uh, 5 and 5, 6, right? Only two ways. The reason I drew it this way is notice that you go up and then you go down. I feel like I, miss, I missed one. No, I just drew this one smaller for no reason. Sorry about that. Um, so what is, the, what is the odds that you roll two dice that they sum to seven? Six out of 36. Six out of 36. Six out of 36 is just uh, one-sixth, right? So in fact, I'll write this as one-sixth. Now, in fact, notice that if you were to count this as a distribution, the probabilities are not uniform. So even though each die is uniform, rolling a die has equal probability of being 1 through 6. Rolling a die is equal probability of 1 through 6. Rolling two die and then summing them will not have equal probabilities, right? Because 7 is far more common than uh, 2 and 3. In fact, what is the probability uh, you get a 2, 3... Uh, 11 or 12, right? One yeah, it's also 1 sixth, right? So in fact, let's say you had a website and it was like a random number generator website and they had the free tier, which was two die. And uh, in order to roll one die, they made you, they locked you out of it or something. So I don't know, can some contrived scenario like this. In fact, if you wanted to roll one die, you could do so by ha setting the side 1 to being 7, side 2 to being uh, 2, 3, 11, and 12, and so on, right? You can simulate two die with one die if for some reason you couldn't just roll them one at a time. Now, you, of course, you can always just roll one die and ignore the other option, but suppose you couldn't. You could simulate the probabilities this way, right? Some games, some like board games, you know, they want to have things not have equal odds. You know, they want, like, the probability of success should be... Uh, like this specific outcome, a boring one, should have high probability, and then an extremely interesting event should have low probability. But the way they can simulate that with one die, because if you, if you roll a die and you say the good thing happens with one six, if you roll a six and the bad thing happens if you roll a one, that means the good things and the bad things happen with equal chance. So a lot of times board game rules will have you sum up die in a certain way, so that if you roll a 12 or a one, then the rare thing happens. And then like in the middle, it doesn't matter. Like, the boring thing happens, right? Uh, questions on this so far? In fact, we could even uh, compute the other ones and, and, and sum them up, right? Because there's 36 things we've laid out here into 12 boxes, we could sum up that this is, you know, one. This is one over 36. This is one over 36. This is two over 36, and so on, right? You could sum them all up and notice that the sum of those fractions would have to equal what? One, yeah, they would have to be equal one because uh, there's 36 options, right? So they have to fall in those 12 boxes somewhere. You sum them up, you're going to have uh, one, 36 over 36, right? Uh, questions on this example? So the great thing about, um, well, actually, I'll do one more example. Um, so again, one of the inventions reason that um, probability theory was invented was uh, because a guy, some guy, I think it was Cardano or something, he could not stop gambling. He would put odds on everything. Um, and, you know, probability theory was in invented to try and make science of uncertainty. Uncertainty is like you don't know something, right? But you want to still have a good estimation or, or something about this, even about something maybe you can't determine. Um, and you know, you would think that gamblers would learn uh, something about probability theory because it would help them with their odds. So let's consider a slot machine. You, have, you know, everyone knows what a slot machine is, right? And then you have like a big, you have a big arm on it and then you like pull the arm and it shows you lots of flashes of colors and lights and sounds and it, it uh, you know, dee -dee 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 -dee, and then you uh, put a coin in and you maybe you get some coins out, okay? Now, the reward scheme of this is kind of complicated, but let's just consider 
we'll consider expectation after the break, but let's just consider like, uh, what are the odds that you even win? You know, forget payoff or anything like this for now. Um, do you guys know off the top of your head how many symbols are on each uh, wheel? Anyone know? Twenty? No, it's definitely not twenty. Eight? I think it's eight, and I thought it was six until I Googled it this morning. You, you got what? You got the pear? No, you got the lemon. You got the bar. You got the diamond. You got the cherries. Anyway, let's just say there's nine. Let's say there's eight, okay? I don't remember. I, I thought there were six, but apparently I, th I think there is eight, okay? Um, so there's eight outcomes on the first wheel, eight outcomes on the second wheel, and eight outcomes on the third wheel, okay? So if we consider each wheel to be uh, independent, we would say, how what is the set of possible outcomes? How many outcomes are there? Eight to the third. Which is what? Uh, I don't know. 512? Okay. Makes sense it's a power of two, right? Okay. So there's 512 possible outcomes, okay? Now, there are, we agree that there's eight on each wheel. There are, I, mean, I know there's like smaller rewards if you get two in a row or something, or combinations like this. And it makes it difficult to calculate. But let's just simplify this in, in a certain way. What is the probability that you uh, get three in a row? So our, our set here, uh, our event here is that you have 512 possible outcomes, and A is the subset of omega such that it is three in a row, right? What is the size of this A? How many ways can you get three in a row? Eight ways. Eight ways. Why? Because it's eight symbols. Yeah, you can get eight diamonds. You can get eight cherries. You can, no, excuse me, you get... Uh, three in a row of diamonds, three in a row of cherries, three in a row of bar, whatever. You can get one three in a row for each possible symbol that there is, right? So we have uh, eight possible winning scenarios out of 512 total possible scenarios. What is, someone do that fraction for me on a calculator. Give me the percentage. I don't know what numbers are. 164. One over 64. Okay, what is that as percentage? That's true, it's 1 over 64, definitely. 2 cubed over 8 cubed, right? 1.56%. Um, you have a, so you have a 1.56%, okay? Now you go in the casino and you, get, you see all the flashing lights and buttons and it overwhelms you like a toddler and you think, wow, I'm going to win. But in fact, every time you pull that lever, you spend like a quarter or whatever and you only have a 1.5% 1 1 chance of winning, right? That sounds, that's much, much lower. You know, I would bet you have a higher chance of getting hit by a car every time you use a crosswalk here than you have uh, ever getting a three in a row when you uh, play a slot machine. Now, this is an oversimplified calculation because I think you do get points if you get two in a row. And, you know, I'm glad no one understands how to play slots. I think that's, I, I hope, hope for the future uh, with you guys. Um, but really, implicitly, when we, we've done a, a, a kind of a sub-problem here, right? For both of these. We here didn't do one thing 512 different ways. We did three things eight different ways each. So in fact, you can combine the probability of smaller things to consider a probability jointly of many things, right? So um, the great part about set theory is that you get to apply set theoretic tools. Let's say you have two outcomes, perhaps not disjoint. Uh, a union B, we may write in terms a and B are sets, but we may write the probability of those as a function of the probabilities of A and B. What do we think probability of A union B ought to be? What is this? This maybe should remind you of something. Two words I'm looking for. Inclusion and exclusion. Inclusion and exclusion. It turns out that the probability of A union B is equal to the probability of A minus, excuse me, plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersect B, right? Now, I'm not going to prove this again. We actually proved this twice, if you recall. We proved it in the basic set theory lecture, and we proved it again using counting uh, for the general in inclusion-exclusion principle. And you would be, you should probably just immediately believe that each of those proofs could be done again with a slight tweak. Now you're not counting the cardinalities of the sets, but the probabilities of them, right? 
An important feature of uh, uh, inclusion-exclusion in probability theory is something called union-bound. This comes up pretty often. Like, uh, let's say you have the probability of uh, the union of i is equal to k, I don't, I don't know, of events a of i. This, now you could do something very complicated with inclusion-exclusion, and you would have, you know, everyone remembers the, you know, you subtract the double intersections, and then you add back in the triple intersections, and so on, right? Very complicated formula. It's too complicated in practice. When people are trying to compute events in this way, they can upper bound the probabilities uh, by uh, what's called the union bound, which is just the sum of i equals 1 to k of PR of AI, right? That should perhaps be immediately believable. Why is that true? Do we believe that? Basically, you take this part and you ignore this part. That's sort of the answer. This part is small. Now, when is this when is this inequality equal? When is this when is the when do you have equality here? When do these match up? Partitions. Yeah, and a partition by definition is when the, they're pairwise disjoint. So if none of the events overlap, then it simply is the sum of the probabilities of each of those outcomes, right? So. In general, this, this, the, of course, it's gonna, the probability of anything must be less than 1, one or uh, less than or equal to 1, right? But here you have a sum of probabilities. So the sum of those probabilities is not guaranteed to be less than 1. Only when you do the inclusion-exclusion do you get the less than 1. So this is maybe something bigger than 1, which is unfortunate, but that's sort of the reality when using inclusion-exclusion. Um, Union-bound is, is, a, is, a, is a, you know, a technique like the 1 minus P of A. It's one of those things that comes up that's like in your toolkit for probability theory, in pure probability theory. Inclusion exclusion is useful by itself, though. Um, so everyone know what it knows what a deck of cards is. Everyone knows how many how many cards are in a deck of cards. You guys have used a deck of cards. There's like an app on the App Store that's called Deck of Cards. You know, it's supposed to. It's an app, but there's a real thing called a deck of cards, and there's 52 pieces of paper. And uh, what a deck of cards is. I don't know. You guys don't know what a deck of cards are because last semester someone's asked on the exam, uh, could we get, get, get a cheat sheet? to know what the cards are in a deck of cards are. So you guys have to know what a deck of cards are if we're going to do probability theory. So OK, how many cards are in a deck of cards? 52. There's 52 cards. You have four sweets. Suits? Sweets. Sweets? I'm going to say sweets. Four sweets. You got the numbers. You got the A, which is supposed to be a 1. And then you got, you got two through 10, and then you have a jack, you got a queen, and you got a king, right? And the four suites are going to be, you got the, the tree, you have the heart, you got the shovel, the, yeah, whatever. and then you got the diamond, the diamond yeah. OK. Um, what is the probability? Let's say cards are, by the way, how many shufflings are there of a deck of cards? Common first question, not probability question. 52 factorial. Someone Google 52 factorial for me. Give it to me. Give me the significant digits. 8 times 10 to the 67. Okay, that's a lot. That's a lot of, uh, I couldn't, I don't have a good large number analogy for us here, but that's like probably more seconds than have ever existed for humanity. Or something like this. If you were to look at one shuffling of a deck of cards every second, you would die before you exhausted 52 factorial, right? So one of the reasons card games are so interesting is because when you shuffle the deck, what is the probability that you shuffle? Let's say you have a shuffling of the deck, and you give it to a guy, and he reshuffles it. What is the probability that the reshuffling is equal to the previous shuffling? That square. It should be squared. So let's, okay, let's fix the, oh, here's, a, let me reword the problem. Let's say you have an, uh, let's say you have an unshuffled deck of cards. You give it to somebody, he, shuffle, he shuffles it. What is the probability that when shuffled, it's in perfect order? It's the order that it comes in when the deck of cards is new. 1 over 8 times 10 to the 67. Yeah, it's 1 over 52 factorial, right? This is an approximation, by the way, it's not exact. 
So there's a 1 over 52 factorial chance that shuffling a deck of cards will be something that's a, a position that is known in some sense. Now, if you were to enumerate all kind of interesting or known positions, there are not that many of them, right? So with high probability, every time you shuffle a deck, it's been a shuffling that has never existed before, right? You can, instant, you can create an instance of an object that has never existed, that has never been seen before with high probability. Every shuffling, every time a deck is shuffled, that is a shuffling of a deck that has never existed in the universe, ever, in all of human history, right? Part of the reasons we have so many cards, you know, and that, gro that number grows, of course, with the number of cards. 52 is enough, it turns out. Yes? Uh, for 52 factorial, it's because you have the, the order? Exactly. It's a permutation. The first card has 52 choices. The second card is 51 choices. The third card is 50 choices, and so on. So it's going to be 52 times 51 times 50, and so on, all the way. The last card is determined. It's going to be 1. Right? Um, so there's 52 cards. The numbers of shufflings is 52 factorial. So the probability that a, a random shuffling, a uniformly random shuffling, is going to be a known position is really small. It's, neg it's nothing. Uh, basically 0, but never 0. You can't divide by 0, right? What is the probability you shuffle a deck and you draw uh, the uh, queen of hearts? How many queens of hearts are there in a the deck? There's one. So there's one over 52. Um, now, let's use inclusion and exclusion for the following thing. You play a slightly different game. What is the probability you draw a queen or a heart? We may write this using inclusion and exclusion as the probability is that you draw a queen. Plus the probability of the event that you draw a heart. Minus the probability you draw both. And what is the probability you draw both? It's the queen of hearts. Right? What is the probability you draw a queen? 4 over 52. There's four queens. What is the probability you draw a heart? 13 over 52. And what is the probability you draw both? 1 over 52. So what is uh, 13 plus 4 minus 1? 16 over 52. Someone give me those, then, the, those numbers. Four over 13. Can you give it to me in decimal? Um, 0 0.307. OK. So basically, you have a 3 in 10 odds of drawing a queen or drawing a heart, right? But drawing the queen of hearts has like a 2% odds. So drawing the queen of hearts, very small chance, basically slightly less than 2%. Drawing a queen or a hearts, basically almost 30% odds, 30% odds, right? Um, so this, you can see the difference between the and and the or. It's really big, right? The or, of course, is going to be bigger. The union of sets is going to be bigger than the intersection of sets. And we see that observed here with probabilities as well. Right? Inclusion and exclusion can be done for many such cases. Right. Questions on this example? All right, let's talk about conditional probability. Conditional probability is basically what is the probability something occurs given some information that you already know, right? So we may write uh, the probability of A, and we'll write this bar given B. And this is read as uh, A given B to be equal to the probability of A occurring given that B has already occurred. B is some event. It's a subset of omega. It's something that has already happened. Given that that thing has already occurred, A occurs. What is the probability A occurs? This has a formula, and it's simply the probability of A intersect B divide by the probability of B. Right? So uh, sometimes now you may be, you know, kind of jumping out of your seat. When would what does that mean for like B occurring to imply A occurring? Sometimes it doesn't mean anything. 
right? Like some, sometimes events are what we call independent. So independent events are those which the occurrence of each has nothing to do with each other. There are such independent events. For example, the weather is totally independent of the day of the week. Um, you roll two die. The probability that the first die is a three, given that the second die is, is a three, those are independent events. The roll of the first die has nothing to do with the roll of the second die. Um, and, and you kind of have to come at this both with like a math understanding and also like an intuitive understanding. Like, yeah, those should have no dependence on each other in a philosophical kind of way. You know, um, the weather does determine many things, like how good your sourdough starter is going to be, or all kinds of interesting things. But a lot of times, such events are, are considered to be independent, right? Um, if uh, if a comma b are independent, they have no uh, basis on each other. There, uh, a and b are independent if and only if the probability of a intersect b is equal to the probability of a times the probability of b. So intersection, quote unquote, kind of splits if the events are what we would call independent. Wow. Whatever. Let's prove it, right? So what is the probability? Uh, let's say like a is the probability you roll a, you have two die, OK? A is the probability you roll a 3, and B is the probability you roll a 3. You roll a 4, OK? You roll a 3 on die 1, and you roll a 4 on die 2 should be independent. So what's the probability you roll a 3 on die 1, and then a 4 on die 2? 1 6 times 1 6. 1 6 times 1 6 is going to be 1 36, right? And in fact, that's true here. So that's 1 6, that's 1 6, and that's 1 36, right? We could prove this using um, uh, our formula of conditional probability. If A and B are independent, like philosophically so, what should the probability of A given B be? Like, don't think about math for a second. Think about the way you deal with randomness. A given B, if A and B have nothing to do with each other, let's say B is the event that it rains today, and A is the event you eat a sandwich. What is the probability you eat a sandwich given that it rains today? Sorry, say again? Just the probability of A. Yeah, exactly. If B has no effect on A, then the probability of A occurring is just the probability of A. But we know that the probability of A given B by the formula is given to be the probability of A intersect B divide by the probability of B. And that's equal to the probability of A. So what do you do here? You multiply both sides by probability B, and the theorem is proven. So if A is independent, the probability of A intersect B is equal to the probability of A times probability of B. Now to prove an if and only if, what do you do? You just go the other way. Assume probability of A intersect B is equal to uh, probability of A times probability of B. Divide both sides by probability of B. Work backwards through it, and you'll get that probability of A conditioned on B is equal to probability of A. Probability, B, probability of A given B is equal to probability of A. So therefore, A and B are independent. Right. So events sometimes have nothing to do with each other. Right. Sometimes they do have things to do with each other. And that's probably more useful when, when this formula comes out. Um, Let's say you flip two coins. You flip two coins. What is our sample space? What is our set of outcomes? Heads or tails. Sorry, what? Heads or tails. Heads. Well, if you flip one coin, the set of outcomes is heads and tails. If you flip two coins, what is our set of outcomes? Heads, 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 heads tails, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, tails. tails. Um, four outcomes, okay? So what is the probability 
let's say you have the probability of uh, you uh, flip two heads given you flip at least one head. Okay, so let's write, let's write this out. What is, the, what is A as a set? What is the probability you flip two heads? What is A as a subset of omega? Not the odds of A, but the outcome, the events in A. Heads, heads, yes. And the probability of A occurring is one fourth. We'll get to that in a second. Now, what is the, what is the set of outcomes in B? Heads, 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 tails, tails, heads. Right? As you said, the probability of A occurring is 1 over 4, and the probability of B occurring is uh, 3 over 4, right? So what is the probability? This is equal, then, to the probability of A intersect B divide by the probability of B. What's the probability of A intersect B? What's the size of A intersect B, first of all? 1. Yeah. So what's the probability of A intersect B? What's the probability of B? What is 1 fourth divided by 3 fourths? 1 third. So here we have an example of non-independent events, right? The probability you flip two heads, that probability changes given that the fact that you will flip one head. If you, now, it doesn't say which head you flip. If it was given that the first one was a head, if, if this was changed to be the, the first flip is ahead, then this probability would have been just determined on the second flip only, which would have made this one half. Right? The probability, then, that you flip two heads, given that one of them is one head, is one third. Right? That's not a nice natural number, like, uh, for flipping coins. One third chance of something occurring. But given that you know when one of them will be heads, if that outcome is guaranteed to happen... If that event is guaranteed to happen, then the probability you flip two heads is only a third, right? Because uh, by, our, by our formula, right? Yes? Wait, what, why is it not one half? Ah, because it doesn't know. The, the, the event B is not that the first one is a head. The event B is that you get at least one head. Now, what, how does that practically make sense? Maybe it really doesn't because it's like, how do you know this outcome is, occurs? Let's say you know this outcome occurs and then... You flip two coins. But how do you really know that? Like physically? Does it maybe make sense? But let's say you're promised a, a witch comes and says promises you that you will get one head. And that you want to know the probability you flip two heads. So that's the that's the it ends up being one third. Kind of it one of the fascinating things about probability theory is you have to be able to like extend it. Like again, it explains all past observations and makes future predictions. This doesn't really like naturally make sense because you would think you would not think this would be one third, right? But science says so. So that's the end of the discussion on that. Any questions on uh, what we've done so far? All right, let's take a little break and we'll be back.